Good morning. Good morning. I'm very tiny. Yeah, I see. Big. What the heck? It's for Lilliputians. What the heck? We've got to rectify that. We may need, under, how about that? That's I look a, much bigger. It's like magic. But it's blurry. Oh, am I blurry? What do you think? No, now it's better. Do you see it? Do you see it looks good? Yeah, it does. I don't know. I'm not thrilled with looking at myself <laughs> this morning, <laughs> but it's going to work. <laughs> it's going to work. The show must go on. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get this done. Good morning, Dr. Rosen, sweet. It's good to see you. Good morning, Carolyn. It's always good to see you, too. Thank you are. so much. Here we are, and we've got our questions. But you know what is very exciting is that we get to see you again tomorrow with Dr. Kira, who is my doctor, and a few other ladies' doctors as well. Both of you together. That's a treat. As in, yes, I, I do look forward to that. We, uh, I'm going to interview Kira, or Kira and I are going to have a discussion, Dr. Yeah. Barr. Tomorrow on Facebook Live, it's uh, it's an additional thing for ins and outs of menopause. And uh, yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Yeah, it looks absolutely, good. she is a gem. So good morning um, to the women coming up, all Facebook users. Oh, thank you, wonderful to see our smiling faces. And I'm hoping you guys are smiling too. So <laughs> I'm going to get started with um, question number one, which I wrote to you in all weird nursing language yesterday. <laughs> I'm not going to present it that way. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> excuse me. All right. So this woman writes in, um, I use compounded bias and progesterone in a combination. So she's using all three together. Um, is it better for me to have them separated so that I can apply them in two different locations? Goes on to say, is it okay also to apply to the labia area because that's where her doctor is having her apply it? And one more, um, she says that she takes the hormones for six days and goes off on day seven. And she knows that you say that um, it's good to go off once per month. So trying to address all three of these questions in one. And I think you get it. Yeah, I like it too. It, did it come out okay? <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Good. Um, you know, in the world of treating women with hormones, how your how this person is doing it is a million miles ahead of how it all began yeah. a thousand, a thousand years ago with the Chinese. Yes. And then 50 years ago with uh, horse urine derived estrogens. It's come such a long way. I, I just really appreciate the elegance of what's being done here. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I would make upgrades and corrections to this, and it's not the way that we do it at this time. And one of the things that I always recommend is part of the menopause method is number one, take the bias in an individual dispenser. However you're going to dispense it, have it be its own individual thing. And the yep. reason is optimal for estrogens is twice daily administration, not once daily. There's different requirements. The, the nocturnal thing is really important to uh, be able to support alleviation of a hot flash in the middle of the night. Because that can be very disturbing. It can trigger adrenaline. A woman can sit up for a couple of hours if she does that. We could have a yeah. whole six-hour-long talk about a hot flash in the middle of the night. Believe me. Ugh. Not fun. And then one of the things that, that I've cared about for a long time is not only what's a good idea, but what is the absolute best long-term <laughs> of anything we're talking about. And right. as far as estrogen administration, it's actually twice daily. The ovary didn't do it one dump it, of right. estrogen in the morning. No, it parsed it out. And the optimal, when you try and put together practicality with not getting estrogen spikes because you only did it once a day, when you do estrogen once a day, i.e. biased, you wind up getting a spike. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, well, okay, better than better than no estrogen at all, but not the optimal. We don't want spikes. We don't want one spike in a 24 hour. We want a couple, oops, I'm gonna, I'm gonna a couple of small things here. We, because spiking in the world of estrogen or any hormone, it just isn't physiologic. So we want biased in the morning and biased in the evening. Oh, when should you take biased in the evening? Well, the most practical time to do it is when you take your progesterone. However, some women find biased stimulating Fair enough. They need on their twice day application, morning is fine, but also we need to take it earlier in the evening, like four o'clock or five o'clock or six o'clock, because if they take it any later, they get into overstimulation. Right. Now it's not common, but it's common enough that and here we go. <laughs> Sound too complicated? No. But it all comes down to every single woman discovering with the support of their, their healthcare professional, how to get it optimal for you. Now, practically speaking, oh, here, this is the second part of this question. Can you combine progesterone and biased? Not in my mind. Right. But here's the thing about progesterone. Number one, it's the great calmer. It can really help you with sleep. So do you want to take progesterone in the morning? Now. You well, can... if you're really anxious and you've, you know, I mean, would that be I'll helpful? Get there. I'll get there. Sorry. But the most common thing we want to uh, support a woman with is the, is the role that progesterone can play in sleep. So although biased is optimally administered twice daily, progesterone is not. Optimally, progesterone is uh, administered at sleep time. That's why I never try and combine biased and progesterone ever, because that you want to do it in. I've tried, but you want to do it optimally as independent things. Now you brought up an exception, Carolyn, and this is how I learned about the exception. And if all this sounds blurry to you. Well, it is. It's it's to, it tells you what the, what really individualization really amounts to. So, what's the moral? Women, once again, it's go out and find somebody who really knows what they're doing, and together with that uh, healthcare provider who's really specializing in menopause, get down into the weeds and get it right for you. Because within four months, you could get it so individualized to you that that could set the template for the whole rest of your life. We're talking 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So it's worth getting this one right. Right, absolutely. So I want to go back into the complexity. So back in the days, one thing I learned really right out, of, and this is, we're talking early 1990s, that I, I, I realized right on that women were so individual that I had to form a partnership with them and we had to figure out each woman individually. And thus I did. And so I wrote that book to give the woman enough information that she could be at the helm of what it felt like in her body. And together we could figure out what was individual for her. So I had women patients do this on their annual visit. Um, I would say, well, how's it going for you? And they would make a comment like, I really like that progesterone. It really calms me down. Um, and not only calms me down at night, do you think it would be all right to take it during the day? This would happen every so often. <laughs> and I'd go, I'd, go, I'd go, what do I know? You know, I'm not, I'm a man. This isn't taking place in my body. I'd say, sure, why not? Just be careful that you don't take too much, that you get groggy and you can't operate heavy machinery, such as your crane that you're operating and uh, building skyscrapers. <laughs> Or let's get it more realistic, driving your automobile or working your computer. <laughs> because progesterone can really calm you down too much and make you a little drowsy. So I would say, sure, just get the dose right. Well, they would say to me stuff like this. Well, I already have. <laughs> I progesterone during the day. And I really like it because it really uh, calms me down.
And the anxiety has been part of what's given me so much trouble. So this is how I learned how to do it, right? So it's all about individualization. But I suggest that you do not want to do biased and progesterone alone. I mean, uh, meaning like in a combination. In combination. You want to break them out into two individual things and you figure out for yourself. You want bias twice daily, but why? Because you're thinking in terms of 30, 40, 50 years. You're not thinking in terms of, well, what's going to be the immediate and only solution for me? Estrogen, it's splitting that dose. Progesterone, it may be just taking it at night. Or it may be splitting it as well. Well, you got to find that out. Well, someone who really knows what they're doing is going to help you do that. And not only that, I favor, and this is part of the question, trying to uh, in, keep these estrogens and progesterone to separate parts of the body. For example, you know that we want application of the bias to the soft forearms. Rub them together. Yeah. We want the soft forearms to be the location that their body gets used to absorbing the estrogen. Whereas progesterone, we not, don't necessarily want to put it in the same spot. These are much different size molecules with much different, uh, I mean, just think about it. We do a progesterone that's 200 milligrams per milliliter, whereas we do a bias that's 30 milligrams per milliliter. Divide 200 by 30. They're, they're, a body, a woman's body really likes much more progesterone. And it's a, it's a larger molecule, so you have to be, so I like to see them go in individual spots. And I like to see the progesterone begin at least on the inner thigh. There's other places that it's possible. So now, that, oh, let's talk ahead. about the labia. Yeah, exactly. I want my next words. Or the vagina or the clitoris as an area to apply it. Right. Great area. However, there's a major caveat. Part of excellent menopause medicine is being able to test a woman accurately. Well, you can't get the answer accurately by blood tests. You can get some ballpark information, but you can't get it accurately by blood. You certainly can't get it by saliva. Uh-oh, going to get some pushback on that. Well, I'm not, I don't care. It's okay. <laughs> well, how are you going to get it? You're going to get it by 24-hour urine hormone test. Uh-oh. And if it's applied to the vagina or the clitoris or the labia, you're not going to get accurate results. That makes sense, yeah. And here's why. When I, I'm going to tell you the classic example. Okay. I had a woman who went into premature menopause. She was married and happily married. And she started, she started getting vaginal dryness. That's obvious from... The, but yet she was still her husband and she still had a very beautiful and trusting relationship and they wanted to have intercourse. So we did what we'll often do is we'll not only start her on her systemic bias to her forearms, we gave her some extra vaginal estriol. Usually don't have to do that for more than three months because we wanted to accelerate vaginal health repair so somewhere along the line she was getting vaginal health repair she, the the pain on intercourse was disappearing eventually we'll just rely upon the topical to her forearms estrogen but with that jump start of helping vaginal repair by one bottle of estriol is a great way to go for especially for a woman who really loves having intercourse with her beloved. And here's what we did. When uh, she was very scientifically oriented, so she wanted to test earlier than I was even interested in testing. But I say, hey, listen, you want to test? Let's do it. it. It's a good time to test. And she was smart enough to ask the question, I'm going to do 24-hour urine hormone test. Do you think it's okay that I'm doing vaginal estriol? Will that change our results? Why would that change our results? Because the, the urethra, which is the tube that goes from bladder to vagina, is right in proximity to where she's applying estriol. Right. She asked the question, 
because I'm applying it to my vagina, will that interfere with my test results? And I went, wonderful point. Let me even talk to the PhD owner of the laboratory, who's the world's expert on this. And he said, yeah, probably she should omit her vaginal estriol for 48 hours prior to doing the collection. Well, this patient was a little more rigorous and she omitted her bias, her estriol vaginal application for 60 hours. And what did we get? She collected her urine and we got estriol levels that were off the charts. And my whole, very, very high. And there was obvious an issue. But yeah. It blew my theory that I believed forever that the vagina being a mucosal surface is a much better surface to absorb. Well, that may be true, but we learned about this, that it also could linger longer than 60 hours Ooh. And, and contaminate urine output. Right. Contaminate our urine 24 hour urine hormone test. Got it. So it did. And so we didn't really learn about her because the estri estriol levels, even though she omitted her vaginal estriol for 60 hours, her vaginal estriol was astronomically high, meaning that it still lingered in the vagina. No big deal, clinically she was getting better. And eventually we retested her after she wasn't using her vaginal estriol anymore because she had gotten return of healthy vaginal mucosa. So we tested her again and she wasn't applying the estriol vaginally at all. And sure enough, she was came in with just wonderful results. So it was scientific proof to me that, oh, it does linger in the vagina. And the thing about 24, and I'm not talking about that five point, let's be on filter paper test five times. No, Nix, you know, I'm strongly opinionated. You know, I'm going to express to you my very best shot. <laughs> If I thought that that five-point urine was okay, hey, great. That's another, another way to test. But I do not believe that at all. And I'm just going to return us to the 24-hour urine hormone test. That is the issue with any kind of application to the vagina, the clitoris, or whatever hormone we're talking about. It just unfortunately interferes with the 24-hour urine hormone test which is not a real impediment. As great as the vagina is as an absorptive surface, it's not necessary. So <laughs> simple question, Carolyn Shapiro. Oh, you've done it again, <laughs> or I've done no, it again. Simple, simple answer, Dr. Rosensweet, you've done it again. But we so love that. Again. There was another part, so I don't combine. The only thing that we do combine these days is testosterone plus DHEA. And we recommend that you apply it for one place. You can apply it in a lot of different places. But I like we, what I apply it. Works for me. But we what we recommend is that you don't apply hormones to the same exact location. You allow the bias to absorb from wherever you're choosing to apply it. You allow the progesterone uh, to absorb wherever you're choosing to apply it, like inner thighs or abdomen, or in some women, not all women, breasts. And you apply the testosterone slash DHEA combination. Well, there's different places you can do that. You can apply it to the um, external perianal mucosa after a shower in the morning once daily. You can apply it to your posterior deltoids. It's the thing about testosterone is you don't really want to apply it to an area that has hair follicles in it because you're liable to get some local hair growth there. So you just got to avoid those areas. Oh, there's a complexity to the whole deal. <laughs> and there is. I mean, it can feel a little overwhelming when you first start off. But you know what? Every one of these things, you're going to appreciate the excellence of getting it right. And then, you know, three months from now, you're going to have this down absolutely flat. You won't even think about it. You'll just keep doing it and you know yeah page, you will have dialed it in taking care of all the moving parts that leads to excellence Absolutely. around getting your hormones balanced getting them applied to the right place 
in your body, getting ultimately testing to see if we've got the, the beautiful and accurate individualized balance, right amount, not too much, not too little for you. So yeah, a lot of moving parts, but uh, yeah, take your automobile into a mechanic and tell the mechanic, I just want you to fix my carburetor. And the mechanic might say, really? You got 100,000 miles on it. Uh, there's a multitude of things that you could tune up here. How about your distributor? How about your, you have with your rings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You just want to tune up your car. You're going to tell me how to tune up your car. So anyway, Carolyn. I will again, be bringing my car to you because I trust you, and I know that you know who you're talking about. Not about the car. <laughs> The innards of the car. So um, we have wonderful um, um, people up. Hello, everybody. Thank you for your comments. I always get them screenshotted to me. Thank you, Dr. R. So I'm going to go on to the other questions. But th this, I want to ask this, too, because she, she says that her doctor has her on her hormones for six days per week, and she goes off on day seven. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. and right and you advocate for going off for some women i don't everybody different um you know the one the few days a month or whatever it is that you decide or the two of you decide um well again i think that her physician in my my opinion my strongly opinionated opinion is doing something better than most everyone is doing there's a little break in there and I've gone into detail why a break is important, but it's not physiologic. It's not even copying nature. A woman didn't stop her hormones. I mean, a woman's ovary didn't turn off her hormones one day a week. No. She actually turned off, she turned her hormone, up, uh, her hormones coming out of her ovary pretty much down to a couple of days a month, once a month. It was a once a month thing. So we're just copying nature. Either way, it's going to be, there's a, a logic behind why you'd want to stop. We've gone into detail. I'm just, uh, my preference is, hey, when in doubt, copy nature, stop once a month. And, you know, get the general principle of what we're trying to do by that stoppage, whether it's once a week or once a month. Again, right. my is once a month. is trying to prevent a thing called hormone accumulation because the dose was too high. I'm not going to go right into that today. We've done that on several occasions. But if you ask the question again, uh, Facebook user, hey, I'll go back into it. But I'm I'm just, you know, once a week, okay. Better than not stopping at all. But really, I want to take us into once a month, and I want to go into the general principle why we're doing that. And so I'm an advocate of once a month. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And we'll, we'll certainly revisit that, I'm sure. And I always advocate, I mean, this book is amazing, Happy Healthy Hormones. You can download it, download it free. I've bought copies. I've given copies. But those pages, my favorite page, well, all the pages are my favorite, but 326 and 327 are going to really, really, really help you in terms of finding your own um, optimal doses when you're using uh, using these fabulous oils. Okay, so um, can you tell us what um, BHRT is made of, like literally, like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA when it's compounded out? I feel inclined to give you a history of what's in there and as a prelude to answering that question. Okay. The first record that I know of, of trying to replenish women's hormones came from a thousand years ago, what the Chinese aristocracy was doing. You know, it's fascinating. They, these, they, what they did is they made out these outhouses for men young men, young, healthy men, and they made out a different outhouse for young, healthy women. And they had them collect their urine, let's say for women. And, and they would collect the urine of young, healthy women, and they would dry it out. And the aristocracy would take 
that dried out powder that was the result. Oh, that was genius because there are actual hormones <laughs> in that urine. That's why we test the urine because there's hormones in there. Right, and right. They were getting usefulness support that the general population was not getting, the aristocracy was getting. Because yeah. they figured out that there's hormones in the urine. I don't, you know, I don't know how they figured that out. And that if they just took the dried urine, they would be more useful. Let's fast forward to the 1940s and 50s where the pharmaceutical industry picked up on that. They wanted to administer hormones to women in menopause because, duh, they figured out that women in menopause lost their hormones. But they needed a way to manufacture large amounts because, in fact, there was a time, there was a product in the market that they were collecting the urine of pregnant young women. That product actually hit the market. But it didn't sustain. I don't know why. They switched to horses. They switched to collecting the urine of pregnant mares. For one thing, the horse is such a large animal that the amount of urinary output from a pregnant mare is huge. And they would catheterize these pregnant mares and collect their urines. So, yeah, yeah. But bless their hearts, you know, women who took horse urine derived estrogens and even the combination product with these artificial progesterones, they sure did a heck of a lot better than the general population. Yeah. Yeah. I can sure. I can spot in a minute. You show me a seven year old woman and I will tell you whether she's on hormones or not. You, you know what? I'm going to do. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. You, 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 you probably pick up on that too. Nowhere, wherever you go, you can say, Oh, this woman's on hormones and this woman is not. <clears throat> and you should be able to tell that. And there were 18 million American women prior to 2002 on horse urine derived estrogens and progestin. And you could see the difference. And, you know, a lot of good was done. And we've mentioned this many times that they were not at risk. They were not at risk for increased risk for cancer. They were at reduced risk for cancer, popular, uh, contrary to popular whatever. So here I go. I'm going off on a tangent again. No, I want to take us back to what is the, what's in these hormones <clears throat> excuse me so in the 1980s dr jonathan wright a real grandfather pioneer yeah when treating uh, women thought hmm premarin why don't we see if we can do something better and what had happened was the birth control pill was invented in the 70s or 60s i forget 60s and one of the things that Dr. Wright knew is that instead of horse urine going into the estrogen component of the birth control pill, it wasn't that. They were using pure bioidentical estradiol. And he knew that. Somehow the pharmaceutical industry didn't want to put the estrogen component of the birth control pill. They didn't want to use the horse urine. They wanted to identify and put in as far as the estrogen component goes, pure estradiol, which is identical to what the ovary produced. Now they went ahead and found pure estradiol, but they couldn't patent that because you can't patent the molecule that's in the body. So they tied up that pure estradiol with something called ethanol, and I'm not gonna go into the technicality of that, and they patented that. There's two components of the birth control pill, ethanol, estradiol, and a progestin. And that's the birth control pill. Well, Dr. Wright knew that that pure estradiol was out there. And he inspired, tasked his compounding pharmacist to say, hey, go out there and see if you can find that estradiol. It's being manufactured. Go get it. And that, and that compounding pharmacist in the early 1980s did go out there and get it. Where did they get it? From I was just going to say, where did they get it? Pharmaceutical manufacturers, they were producing that, and they what? The, where were they getting it? Right. That's uh, next question. The estradiol was producible from the plant world because tell me something, Carolyn Shapiro, how different am I or you from a plant? That's my question. 
Like, are you much different? How different are you? How different am I from a plant? Well, just for fun, we are different. I mean, I look different. Yeah. Yeah. I look different than a carrot, hopefully. Not a lot. Not, not a lot. I agree. I mean, <laughs> you're a little yeah. more broccoli like, but that's all right. <laughs> well, the plant world has similarities to us. For example, the plant world has hormones in it. Right. And they're happy to share with us, which always makes me so happy. Nature. In fact, nature has within the soybean world or the yam world a biochemical precursor to estradiol, estriol, testosterone, progesterone, DHEA. It's called diastinin. Diastinin. And so diastinin. the pharmaceutical industry oh. started extracting with their excellent, excellent methods of purity and scrutiny and rigor. They started extracting diastinin from soy and yam and so soy is so much easier there's so much large quantities of it that they bought up soy fields they own soy fields and they started extracting diastinin and converting it through biochemical means through pure estradiol estriol testosterone and dha so what is in bioidentical hormones well the ultimate derivation is from soy mm -hmm. practically speaking Mm -hmm. you go to your compounding pharmacist and your physician or healthcare provider is ordering biased, for example, which contains estradiol and estriol, what's in it? A pharmaceutical grade, pharmaceutical company derived conversion of diastinin from soy into biased, into, well, it's components, estradiol and estriol. And also you can play the, with the biochemistry. Anyone who's familiar with biochemistry, if you're really, really sophisticated, you can convert that diastinin into progesterone. You convert it into testosterone. This you is know, the, evidence, the rigor, the phenomenal um, specificity that's possible in the world of 1980s. And that's what's in the hormones. And when you're dealing with what the compounding bio, uh, pharmacist purchases from pharmaceutical manufacturers is rigorously extracted and converted powders of pure estradiol, pure estriol, pure testosterone, <clears throat> same molecule as what's in the human ovary. And they're putting it up into creams and gels or thank goodness gracious, now into organic oils yeah organic oils and that's what they're doing and god bless Do dr jonathan wright for uh, being the convert the think the the converter that he is and that also occurred from a compounding pharmacist simultaneously just outside of dallas a dear friend of mine jim Ernster. yeah he's actually on this group and sometimes he chimes uh, yeah jim, hello to you recovering from the texas freeze out which is where I'm going to be going soon. And it better not be freezing there when I get there because I'll be very upset. I'm frozen here and it's 60 degrees. Um, there's a question that came up and I, it kind of correlates, I think, with this. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of, I'm sorry, but it says, I don't understand why he, meaning you, um, prefers to test a waste product for active hormone levels. I understand why it would be done to see how the body is metabolizing the hormones, but not to see what active levels are. Does, does well, that's a good question. And the real question is, can you test a human being and get anything of value around anything that you want to test? And if you can, what's the proper way to do it okay so <clears throat> let's say that there could be value in knowing what any individual patient's blood glucose level i'm sorry what their body glucose level is oh turns out there's enormous value in being able to assess 
what a human being's body glucose level is. And there's several ways to do it. Originally, back in the day, a while ago, the way someone could test a human being's glucose level was to taste their urine. Because they learned, in fact, how diabetes is named. It's called diabetes mellitus. They learned that there was a condition where people were getting sick. And how they figured it out was their urine was too sweet, mellitus, sweet. They learned that they could learn, monitor someone's total body sugar level by tasting their urine. And if it was sweet, look out, there's a problem there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If there was sweet, their general body glucose level was too high, which was a very significant thing. Well, guess what? The technology improved. There came a point where they could also measure the glucose by drawing blood. Well, when I was growing up in school, I was at a trans transition point. One of the ways that we were testing diabetics is we weren't tasting their urine. Yeah, I've got a thing that says gross. <laughs> we had ways of testing their glucose levels in their urine. And one of the ways the diabetics were getting monitored was by sticking a dipstick into their urine to see if the glucose was too there much there. It was one way to do it. And it was a great way for a diabetic to test themselves at home. They could check their own urine, stick a dipstick in there, and see if there was too much sugar in their urine. Right. If there was too much sugar in their urine. There was too much sugar in their body. Right. And that would get them sick. Right. And so, well, another way to do is blood tests, but that's a little tricky because you have to go into a laboratory and get your blood drawn. And of course, nowadays, it's really refined. You can get these home blood glucose monitors that you can stick your own finger, ouch, but it's, it's great. Or now there's these things that you can apply yeah, to your on, yeah. and give yourself a reading after every meal. It's just extraordinary. Uh, now, I know I've gone far afield there. I'm telling you, how do we test somebody and have it be clinical, meaningful? Well, how do we test hormones? There's a lot of ways to do it. We could be blood tests, doesn't work. Not in a menopausal woman. And I've gone into this and I go into this in the book. We could do saliva testing and my humble, non-humble, passionate opinion doesn't work. Or we could get a general assessment through 24-hour urine hormone collection. It's not, you're not just measuring the metabolites. You don't have that correct. The actual parent hormones are there. Right, therein lies the, the, the estradiol is in that urine. The estrone is in that urine. The estriol is in that urine, plus the metabolites there. Got it. And it's a doable, feasible collection that a woman can do at home, and it correlates with the medical literature. And it goes way back. 1970, an oncologist at the University of Nebraska, Henry Lemon, wanted to see... Does estrogen levels correlate with breast health? The way he chose to assess estrogens, which was state-of-the-art at that time, 1970, was collect urine for 24 hours and take a look at the estrogens. And he found a difference between women who had breast cancer and women who didn't. He collected the urine of 24-hour urines of women at breast cancer and a woman. You were nursing cancer. students, I believe, right? No, that was me. I did that in, oh. in the, in the, in the two, early thousands. Um, he collected his own. Uh, he chose women he considered to be healthy, and he found a difference. He saw a difference in what showed up in the urines as far as estradiol levels. And right. All levels. It wasn't the metabolites. He found a difference. And so I'm getting technical there. But of the many, I mean, it's not perfect. Why don't you stick a needle into the cells 
and pick up the stick them into the nucleus and see how much estradiol and estrone you can extract from the nucleus because that's where it's active. Well, yeah. you can't do that. No, you can take a biopsy. Uh, yeah, that's not so practical. No, when you try and assess anybody, I mean, we could do that with insulin and glucose too. We could stick a needle or do a punch biopsy right into the cell nucleus and see what the sugar levels are there, what the thyroid, uh, no, impractical. You have to do something indirect. Well, how far indirect do you have to do it? Well, the most, the combination of most accessible, easiest to do, practical, implementable, happens to be in the world of hormones, urine. Because it works. And not only that, we can correlate it with the medical literature. So we can define ultimately what's too much estrogen and what's too little. We can define what's too much testosterone and what's too little. And you cannot define it by symptoms alone. You can have a woman who had tremendous hot flashes. She starts taking estrogen and she reports back to her provider that, oh my God, I feel so much better. Okay, you found your dose. Wrong. Right. We've done testing on these women and 25% of them are in their optimal zone. They don't have too much or too much, little. What's too little? Not enough to protect your bones and your vagina. And if you right. can't do that, how about how's your arteries and your brain doing? Or you're a woman who's too much. I feel fine. And yeah, she's overstimulating breast glandular tissue, putting herself at risk for mitosis and the vulnerability of mitosis cell division in her 50s, which is different than when she's in her 20s. Right. Too much or too little. So 75% of the women, by a study that I did, they report, wow, I feel better. I must have my hormones into an optimal zone. 50% have too little, not enough to protect your bones and vagina, let alone your arteries, brain, everything else. And 25% have too much and putting themselves at risk for breast glands or cell proliferation. So the moral of the story, however you're getting at your optimal hormone dosages, ultimately you want to test in the 24-hour urine hormone test, whether you believe it or not, <laughs> does it? So you, question, know. you don't, you think it's, it's metabolites. No, you need to take a look at what is actually in the urine and you can correlate what's too much and what's too little with the medical literature and what shows up in the urine. So right now it's the easiest and most accurate way of all the methods you can test a woman who you are treating. You want to catch a woman in real time. We want her taking her hormones on a daily basis. In fact, we don't even want her to collect her urine unless she's been religious for the previous seven days. And then she continues to take her hormones just like she always does right through the collection period of the 24-hour urines. That is the best we have to date. Now, if there was a better method, maybe it'll be invented. Maybe we'll be able to um, uh, assess someday the, the, the tears or the uh, poop or whatever. No, I'm just kidding. Right now, it's urine, folks. And if you can come up with a better method, any punch biopsy. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to want to do that, even though that probably could get us into the nucleus of the cell where these things are acting. It's your 24-hour collection. Yeah, you know, I it's mean, only otherwise. Geez, Louise. Otherwise. I, you know, I have these other questions, um, but these other questions are, I mean, it's just fascinating. And I, you know, I met you and that was fascinating. And I, it continues to be, and the women that um, that we deal with and are talking with are so interested to learn so much biochem biochemistry and the science behind. And I know that you have said so often that it's the women that taught you, you know? Obviously you're a doctor, you went to school, you did all the, you know, very hard due diligence that I know that it takes to be an MD. But it was the women that taught you. And I, they blow my mind. 
testing, you know, why is testing blood inferior? Is it because the hormone hormones can be bound and therefore non-detectable by a blood test? I mean, that's a valid question. That's a ter terrifically valid uh, question. And let me tell you about my 50 year career. I've done so much blood testing. I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of blood tests for 50 different reasons or 100 different reasons. Blood is fantastic for analyzing so many things, including a young woman about getting her hormone levels. Only there's a practical glitch there, and I can explain that, it, uh, you know, but I, I won't go there right now. Blood, love it. Blood, always do it 100% of the time. Any woman in menopause that is uh, going into menopause treatment, we want to make sure that she shows up in our consultations with a certain amount of blood tests. And if she doesn't, we send her out there to get blood tests. However, we do not include hormone levels. It's not helpful. For one thing, it's so expensive, oh my God, to test yeah. hormones and metabolites through That's blood. Crazy. For one thing, they're so evanescent in the blood. That means they come and go so quickly. For another thing, if you're treating a woman with hormones, when do you apply, when do you take the blood? Well, you want to relate it to her previous dose because that dose is coming in and going out. Of right. that blood. Evanescence, it's called. It peaks and it leaves the blood. That's not where it's doing its work. It's doing its work in the cell nucleus, ultimately. It's very transient in the blood. Well, when are you going to test her? When are you going to draw her blood? 15 minutes after she took her last dose? Or yeah. half hour? Or 45 minutes? Or an hour? You really want to catch her when she peaks, and you want to be very consistent. Then what do you want to test? How about estradiol? Yeah, that'd be very useful. How about estriol? Yeah, that would be very useful. Um, how about to hydroxy and, you know, four hydroxy and four methoxy? Love okay, you're getting over $1,000 right now because this is not how testing, once you get into this esoteric testing, you get into big money. Whereas for a 24-hour urine hormone test, it's less than $300 for all these metabolites and all these parent hormones. Again, you have to who knows this kind of stuff? Someone who's taken on is, I want to specialize. I want to get fantastic at treating women. I want to specialize. I want to become, I want to zero my intention and my attention right down to what is the right way to do things. Well, well who gets to discover the 24-hour urine hormone test? Those who are super rigorous to say, what's the right way to do this? And then what do they arrive at? And this happened to me. I was right in the beginning this is we're talking 28 years ago i'm starting to treat women in menopause and i want to test because i love to test and i'm having a little challenge because i thought the saliva test was so simple and women could do it at home and they could do a kit and there was a lot of results and it was cheap but my results were getting weird they didn't correlate with what was actually going on in a woman symptomatically and I turned to one of my esteemed colleagues. Oh, yes, it was Dr. Jonathan Wright. Hi, Jonathan. I don't think you've taken the time to listen. Yeah, no, it'd be great. <laughs> you're a busy man. Yeah. He, he said, yeah, David, you're not going to be satisfied in you until you get at that 24-hour urine hormone test. And then it's just going to be life-changing for you. And you know what? It was yeah. life-changing for me. And <laughs> I am not, the only reason that I, well, not the only reason, but the main reason I'm here today is right there, right in the beginning. I started doing 24-hour urine hormone tests and correlating what's going on in the woman, what's going on when we're treating her, and oh my God, I get to see this mountain of beautiful data. And so blood tests, valuable, but you better understand pharmacokinetics. You better understand when did you draw the blood yes, according to the last word. And then you better have your wallet wide open because... <laughs> The insurance company is going to want to do a thousand dollar test on hormones, right? And so you could you can analyze a couple of them, but it's just not enough information. So there's the beginning answer to why no. 
blood. You know, it, do it, blood. It, do do sex hormone binding globulin. If a woman shows up for initial consultation and we don't see a sex hormone binding globulin, we'll send her back to the lab to get a sex hormone binding globulin. Do evaluate a TSH, a free T3, a free T4, and a reverse T3. This, these are the core and uh, gold standard thyroid test. Do that. If she shows up for that first consultation and we're not assessing her thyroid, which is so commonly to go functionally deficient in a woman midlife or a man midlife, we'll send a woman out for those blood tests. And then there's a certain amount of routine tests that we do all the time. But anyway, not for hormones. We just don't I test the hormones. It's a waste of money. I'm telling you, this is where the repetition breeds retention because we visit this so often. And then it's like this aha moment, you know, happens with many, many, many women and they get it and they understand it. And thank you so much for your incredibly kind, amazing patience to 28 years later, continue to repeat this to us. But you have told me that it's, Really, the reason that you're sitting here has to do with the 24-hour urine test and the wonderful women and they came to see you and your wonderful ways with them and you know it's all it's all good. It's it's a it's a as we say mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that word. And yes, sir, re Bob. Okay, so. Um, way deep in the weeds on that one. Um, this is probably not too hard for you to answer quickly. I don't know. It's a test. <laughs> Why do some doctor's offices have a signed consent for testosterone? Good question. You know, number one, every single woman, no exception, zero needs testosterone when she goes into menopause. Got it. I'm saying hi no, to her. No, no, no exception. No exception. I've tested hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women. And I can tell you, a lot of you are, are getting low on testosterone in the perimenopause. Right. For reasons. You've overdriven our stress response. So are men. So many young men now are losing their erection in their late 30s and 40s. How'd they do that? They overstressed and they're not producing sufficient testosterone, loss of erection. So it's not just women. But I tell you, women, huge percentage of you are getting low testosterone even before you stop menstruating and going into, um, and there's a rare amount of you that are having decent testosterone levels, androgen levels when you go into menopause. But all of you, 100%, by three years from your last period, your testosterone is going to be low, 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 and you do not want that. Because some of the most important things you can do is replenish that testosterone. Because why do women wind up in nursing homes and assisted living facilities? Why do women run into a, wind up using adult diapers? Why do women go from walking to canes to walkers to wheelchairs? Uh oh, oh, that's when things get out of hand and they can't be taken care of at home. A lot of them. It's primarily from low testosterone. Low testosterone. You get low testosterone and you get sarcopenia. That right. means you get muscle loss. And you take a look at your thighs. And you take a look at your ability to stand up without using your arms from a chair. And it ain't the same. And you take a look at your triceps area. If you got flab there, you're losing muscle. And if you lose the muscle that holds up the bladder, called the levator ani, along with vaginal atrophy, you wind up with adult diapers and cough incontinence. If you lose the muscle in your thighs and your calves, you wind up in canes and then walkers and then wheelchairs. And that's one of the principal reasons why women go into assisted living facilities. I'm taking this diversion because testosterone is so critical in women. It's this, it's one of the most beneficial things that we do is we restore the androgens, we replenish them. Right. But it's also, it also is, um, it's a um, highly controlled substance that some people. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> you're trying to steer me back to the question, which I've totally drifted away for, Carolyn Shapiro. You're fine, Doctor. Honestly, red-handed. <laughs> <laughs> you read my mind. Either. You knew that I had totally forgotten what the original question was. <laughs> well, it turned out, I don't even remember what decade it was, that there was widespread abuse of testosterone. Athletes or people who just wanted to pump up or whatever it was, widespread abuse of testosterone. So the federal government stepped in and made testosterone a controlled substance, just like morphine is a controlled substance. That means a physician needs a special license, and so does a nurse practitioner, to prescribe it. And it's controlled by the federal government. And it's called a controlled substance. And that's a whole different realm. You cannot prescribe OxyContin without a special license to do so, or any other narcotic. You can't prescribe Percocet which is a narcotic, or codeine, which is a narcotic, or testosterone, same class, unless you have a special license. And when you get into the world of controlled substance and prescription as a physician, there's been so much abuse. Oh, yeah. The physicians are a little nervous about it. Really nervous. So, and those who are dealing with the general public, who well, they don't really have a chance to get to know their patients, they want an informed consent for their own protection. So that's yeah. why they're doing it. And not everyone needs to get the informed consent. It's not a mandatory for the physician, but you know, it's a gray area. And I under totally understand why some physicians want to have their patients sign an informed consent. So they'll have in their record that the patient knows that they're dealing with a controlled substance and they're not going to abuse it. We don't do that in the menopause method. We don't, we don't ask for informed consents. They're a whole story of themselves. But I do understand why some physicians are asking for informed consents because they don't want the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, to leap down their throat and take away their medical license. No, no. Et cetera, et cetera. So that's why it happens. I get it. Thank you so much for answering that one. And, you know, you probably have a hard stop, which we I do. Yeah. I definitely do. Here we are. So, so that's can, about it for today. Can I? Can I just sneak this one in? No, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, Maybe, you go ahead. You go ahead. Um, how can I stop retaining water? Oh, right. Should I keep that for the next for Thursday? Okay, I thought so because that's a big one. That's but it's a, big a good one. one. It's, it's a great. really good Let one. Let me give you the short answer. Okay. Water <laughs> retention, <laughs> water retention can re can relate to hormones, but and it can relate to other things. Right. You can if you're a menopausal woman and you never retained order, water, like you never got swollen ankles, for example, or the sensation like your calves were a little swollen, which could relate to water retention. You want to look at those hormones. Because inadequate progesterone, progesterone is a diuretic, which means if you lose your progesterone, which 100% of you do, 100%, not 99, 100% of you lose your progesterone for all intents and purposes at the menopause or long before, you're going to start retaining water. So some women, when they start taking progesterone, they start losing their water. So one way to get sufficient water uh, uh, you have your kidneys work properly in that regard is to make sure that you're on adequate progesterone. Some other of you are retaining water because you're on too much estrogen or you don't have enough progesterone to balance that estrogen. So one, one way is you get really accurate around the progesterone and the estrogen balance. And then there's a whole other group of you that there's a lot of mo other moving parts. Right. So and the five kidney, we're talking, yeah heart so it's again this is where physicians who paying attention to all this but if you're in menopause and you're not responding to the progesterone and the estrogen then you got to go further but if you're linked up with a really savvy experienced a physician or nurse practitioner they're gonna or pa you're gonna go wow we're not solving 
water retention in, in the midlife with just getting the balance of the hormones, uh-oh, time to refer to a cardiologist or to a nephrologist or to an internal medicine doctor who can, can um, hunker down and figure out if there's some other reason why the woman's retaining water. Now, the most common reason why women retain water in the perimenopause, it hasn't done, doesn't have anything to do with the kidneys and, and, and um, the heart, for example. It has to do with hormonal imbalance coming out of the ovaries. So go there first. Treat the we will go there first. I have, you know, I have, I have this plethora, believe me, of questions for our dear, sweet, amazing doctor. Oh but my goodness! I'm over the hard stop time. So Carol, I know one minute. Carol. That's crazy. So I'm just gonna put one more shout out tomorrow, 7 a.m. Um, Pacific Standard Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Dr. Kira Barr, gem of a woman, my doctor, um, and a few of the other women up here, her, their doctors, who Dr. R has trained overseas. Dr. Kira Barr and Dr. R are going to be speaking. I, I'm really looking forward to that. I can't wait. And then guess what? <laughs> the two of us will be back again on Thursday <laughs> to answer this other plethora of questions from you fabulous women out there thank you everybody for coming up please will you screenshot those to me dr r thank you sir thank you for today big hugs around everybody have a wonderful tuesday enjoy be happy be we'll see you later <laughs>